patience. If you're watching this from at home, please refresh your screen and you'll be with us live. Welcome to you all in the room. It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to have you here at ULEARN 18. Feeling relaxed having a fellow Otagoite in the room and the Cape Crusaders here supporting us. And thank you to the wonderful team working behind the scenes. So we're here for steaming hot, a connected conversation, a live stream session, and we're using the hashtag SendsConvo as well as not at you learn. Join in and have some fun. I love that we started with a little bit of fun. Hearing myself once is scary, twice is <laughs> But it's made me feel kind of relaxed now. Let's join together. Ona here to Paul. To Paul for mama. Tomakia te ao, te ao fata tangata, tātai ki runga, tātai ki raro, tātai ahamau, hauriye, huye, tai ki. Kia ora and welcome. Ki waka e kanoa. A canoe which we're all in with no exception. Let's travel the steaming hot journey together. <laughs> Connected Educator brings you this live streaming today. What can you get from Connected Educator? A year-long calendar of free, online, professional learning and development. It's nothing without you. If you click on Pledge an Event, that's where you share events you're hosting for the rest of us to join in. Sign up for updates and download our starter kit. It's bite-sized chunks of supporting you to connect in your journey. And you can earn badges, micro-credential badges, for your journey as well. So it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome five speakers to the room today. Steaming hot, we have Danielle Myberg, who's going to share a science snapshot. Then we're going to move to technology snapshot with Anahira McGregor and Tamaka Ozeki. Following on from that, we're going to move all the way to the Gold Coast and join Kathy Hunt, who's going to beam into us to beam out. Welcome, Kathy. Then we'll move to Old STE. I forgot E. Apologies. We're going to go to Charlotte for engineering. Charlotte, Charlotte French. Welcome. And then we'll finish up with Raphael Nolden with maths. So without further ado, please welcome Danielle Myberg. Thank you. Ko Blut Taku Awa. No Aferika Kite Tonga Aho Inari Aotearoa Taku Kainga Inaine. Konea Ko Danielle Myberg Aho Tino Koto. Good. Good morning still, a little bit of morning left. Good morning everybody, um, my name is Danielle. Um, I am a teacher at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. I've been there for, um, since the beginning, so I was a foundation staff member there. I also do some part-time work for extra pocket money to indulge my travel bug for the Mind Lab. Um, and I also recently finished my thesis as well. I didn't think I'd ever finish it, to be honest. Like, it just felt like it kept going. Um, but any which way, so um, this is me. Um, it's my Twitter handle. I'm you, some of you might be familiar. I've um, in the past have done a huge amount of work online as well in terms of supporting educators with free professional learning online as well. So we kind of predated all the connected educator stuff and, and started connecting people. So I do a lot of work in that space. The, my quick 10 minute snap, snapshot today, um, I decided that if I just sit here and talk, you're only going to remember half of what I say. So I've got some work for you to do. So if you could please make your way to the tinyurl link up over here, so tinyurl.com forward slash steamed rosebud thorn. The design thinkers in the room will be familiar, I am sure. Um, the link is also on the next page. Just while my details are up there as well on my blog, there's a whole lot of other science and mathsy things that I do as well as all the other things that I dabble in. And I'm quite proud of it because I started it in 2012 and kept it going. It's really cool. So in terms of connected educatorness, get out there, get blogging. It really makes a difference for your practice. So I want to start with, why should students actually learn science? 
Why? Right? We're all buzz about STEAM and STEM and engineering and science and it's the future, but should all students actually learn science? They're not all going to be scientists, so what's the point? There's a number of reasons. So I'm a science teacher, but I also teach a whole bunch of other things. For me, why science matters so much is a whole bunch of reasons that I've put up here. I think perhaps the most common one that we hear when we're hearing these STEAM debates is this idea about economic incentives. So your own financial gain for future careers is like we expect that there might be quite a lot of careers in the science and engineering fields in the future. So that's often a reason. Our governments, of course, knows that the innovation side of things is how they make lots of money too. So of course, they want to encourage the science and STEAM. But actually, there's a lot more to it than just money. With in a time where our students in front of us and for even us in the room, climate change is already having enormous impacts. So in terms of the decisions that we make, did we, are we whinging about our 10 cent fuel tax in Auckland, but we desperately need the transport to reduce our climate emissions? So that understanding of the social responsibility I have comes from my understanding of science and understanding how these my decisions in terms of driving, there's my skateboard, so you know, like how I get around is informed by my science. So social responsibility, you, even ethics come into science. What kind of science should we be progressing and which kind shouldn't we? Raphael will talk to you in a little while about artificial intelligence. Um, and there are huge advancements in that field. But for our students to be able to make wise decisions as technology keeps racing at us and developing, they need to have some understanding. So as, we, as I share my examples today, they've all been informed by quite a wide range of readings. Uh, if you want some books to read, just talk to me. I've always got some recommendations. <laughs> Philip is laughing because she knows. Right, so I thought I would share two examples from my practice today. The first one is my fermented foods party that I organized earlier this year. So you can imagine what that smelled like, right? <laughs> um, what I had the students come in and do is I asked them to write a report on a fermented food from a culture they identify with, with the idea that then, when the report is due, they also bring in the fermented food for our fermented food shared lunch, and then that they compare and contrast their fermented foods. Now, this maybe doesn't seem all very high techy, steamy, what you might have in your head when you're thinking about STEM and all these buzzwords that fly around when we're talking about this stuff. But what this example for me was really meaningful in my practice is, first of all, it connected cultural knowledge. The stuff, when we're talking about culturally responsive pedagogy, we're talking about all our immigrant families, we are talking um, about a huge diversity of students being able to not just draw um, on the science knowledge and all the facts and the content that science often gets turned into, but actually be able to draw on their own cultural knowledge in order to succeed in the science classroom. So that was my experience of it. But on that document, so again, the link is just down there, tinyurl.com and seen Rosebud Thorn, I have put some <coughs> documents up for you. So you actually have some resources so you can see how I scaffolded it. Uh, there is also some additional readings if you'd like to read a bit more about it. And there is also some, uh, so the templates and stuff if you want to facilitate it for yourself. So take a look on there. And what I'd like you to do, just for a minute or two, I'd like you to write some ideas on that table, please. Can you all access that table? We're on it, we can type on it, we're all good. Um, and I just want you to think about this idea, about what's good about this idea, so the roses, what's not so great about this idea, the thorns, and what c would be even better if, or how could we make this idea better, how might we refine? This, because there's so much conversation about STEAM and science, engineering, maths, in the economic landscape, I think it's really important that as practitioners, we stop and take a moment to really think about uh, what reasons are we doing this for? And just because I'm doing science, is what I'm doing any good? So I would like to invite you now to spend a minute to critique my practice. Go crazy. I've got a thick skin. So let's spend a minute and then we'll, um, 
we'll hear some ideas from the audience about what we like, what we don't like about this idea. So, I'm just checking with the microphone that it's okay if I wander around a little. Sweet. Thank you. morning so I'm afraid that's all the time you get but I want to encourage you to come back to this the second example I wanted to share actually just before I change I just want to tell you about the photo that is a rewana bread it's a bread a Mo traditional Maori bread that is made with potatoes so that's we use the potatoes to as a microbe now the student who made this bread called her grandmother from class who told her about a food from her cultural heritage and then she was organized to go and bake it with her grandma so this cultural knowledge was passed on later in the students feedback um, about this my crazy fermented foods party lots of them talked about how they found it really powerful connecting with their own heritage and that as a result they had much greater feelings of reciprocal learning um, of feeling really connected and the knowledge the science knowledge being meaningful and relevant to them so this is my other example i want to share in my last minute today so again if you scroll down there's a rosebud thorn so you can go in and say what you like about it say what you don't like about it um, how it could be even better in this example, what I did, um, as I was actually the maths teacher in this course, so a maths and science teacher, we worked together and had the students design a card game to teach primary school students about climate change. They used the design thinking process to do that, so they went and interviewed the primary school students, found out what they knew about climate change, what they didn't know, found out what kind of games they liked. They then made prototypes and tested them, and we use algebra to model the game because of course you have to make sure that there's enough variation in the game we've got enough resources in the game so and then eventually at the end of it all we went back they played the card game out of a class of 50 kids not a single one turned up without all their resources complete so even the ones who'd stuffed around for weeks on that day they turned up laminated like you would not believe it, it was incredible um, and then we went down to the primary school and they played their game with the primary school students who then wrote them an evaluation which I of course took into consideration to give them grades. I believe that's my timer. So I want to just finish in saying these are just two really short snapshots from my practice. I don't have the answers, I don't even know if I'm doing it right. But what I do know is that when students come into my class the science I want to have them walk away with is to be great citizens that can make informed decisions and don't feel like science is this like white lab coat, old white guy kind of image because lots of our students still experience that. So I want the science to be relevant and meaningful, connected and for our students to make an emotional connection. And that's what drives me. Like I said, I'm all over Twitter. If you need more, get in touch. Thank you. What a, what a privilege to hear your story, Danielle. So we have about five minutes for yes. questions. So Danielle, while our next presenter is getting ready, who wants to start the ball rolling? Uh, Any questions? I can just talk more. about this one, sure. Um, anything in particular you'd like to know? Um, just tell me a little bit more about how you designed it, what level it was for, what they were doing. So this was a year 9 and 10 class. Yep. And they designed the games for year 5 and 6 students. So our, um, the 5 and 6 students from the primary school just down the road. And we did a little bit of teaching about climate change up front, just a little bit just so they kind of have a flavor for it. And then
most of the kids did their own research as they developed the game to build up enough knowledge to be able to design the game. And I don't know how familiar you are with the design thinking process. Yeah, so I um, used lots and lots of resources from the Stanford Design School website. So they have a boot, like a bootleg kit, which is basically a whole manual of how to do facilitate the design thinking process. And it's all free. It's incredible. So I drew on that quite a bit and used that to help me facilitate it for the students. So I would do things like how do you conduct a good interview? We, I would make up some resources about... Um, how to do some modeling with the math. So how do you know that you need enough, that you've got enough cards? So we looked at things like when you play Rummy, for example, and how many cards do you start with? And usually Rummy has a limit of how many players it can have, because if you go over that number, then the variation reduces. So yeah, we looked at some other card games, and then I asked them to think, well, how does this apply to yours? And some of them even ended up in some measurement stuff because they were making hexagons. Um, so their, board, their cards were hexagons that like built into a board. So it was, yeah. Ultimately for me, uh, design thinking is a way of getting me out of the way so that the students can get on and do the amazing learning and the problem solving for themselves. So I'm a very big cheerleader for all things design thinking and I, I highly recommend working that into our science as well. It, <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. I've been using it with skateboarding as well, so everywhere I can get it in. <laughs> Got it. Um, any other questions? All right, shall we pass over to the next person? Steaming hot with science. Without further ado, and I'll try and get it in right order this time, I'd like to welcome Anahira McGregor and Tamako Ozeki, who will share a snapshot around technology. And I believe you're in for a treat, as this might be a bilingual conversation. Education. So my name is Timako Oziki. Um, I'm part of the SENS team. And today by my side I have um, Anahira McGregor. Who's, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, technology, hangaro, hangaro matihiko, and from Māori world perspective, um, what that looks like. Hapai, no reira, patai tua tahi ki a koe. Heha tenei mea te mea hangaro ki a koe, te mea hangaro matihiko ki a koe. So what does this explain to us really, your views on what technology is, and what digital technology is? Over here. Um, great to be here. You've got the most tech awkward person doing this presentation. I'm getting lots of cues, so I need to pinch this. I'm really actually not that tech savvy. I actually sometimes don't even know how to use these things. But my passion is culturally responsive practice and seeing and promoting te ao Māori and all that we do in education. Uh, the focus is talking about hangaro uh, or technology, uh, coding, algorithms. We've been doing them since way back in the ra. So digital technology, for you, those of you that don't know, uh, hangaro um, it literally means technology. Mati hiko, your mati mati are your fingers, and hiko means electric or digital. So um, it's just beautiful, the simplicity. So I guess um, when we're thinking about hangaro, I want to firstly acknowledge our amazing tupuna uh, that were once wakodas, that were just simply incredible at adapting to the environment around them. Um, yeah, so, yeah, hangaro, to me, it's a, we're still doing it, we're adapting and continually adapting into the now digital technology spaces. Kia ora. 
pātai tūrua, kei te kite koe i te uh, tūhonotanga ki te ao Māori me te ao hangarau. What to you are the connections that you can see between Māori worldview and technology? Kia ora, kia ora, tino pātai tērā, uh, ngā tūhonotanga o ngā ao e rua, two separate worlds, but are they really? Um, I've got a few handy pictures to help us maybe understand the concept of, uh, of a Māori world view in technology spaces. So I'm going to push this and it's going to give me a picture, right? Yeah, it worked. Okay, so my first example here is the word fatu. Uh, this is a picture of a hair cat, which is a rain cope. It's a rain cape, a like, bit like what Philippa and Anne have got on today. Uh, this is the inside, the back of it. And pretty much um, to fatu um, a kākahu or a cloak, you need to know things like binary numbers. You have to have the right amount and it has to have a sequential flow or your garment will fall to pieces. So our ancestors were incredibly good at following and creating patterns to make technology work for them. Kapai, that's my first example, fatu. Right. Tuarua. This here is called a kete riwai. Okay, a riwai, um, going back to Danielle talking about potatoes, riwai is our kupu for, for um, potatoes. Eho. This is a kete, and you might think it might not have been made very well because it's got lots of holes in it. But it's got holes, the technology on purpose was created in that way where the harakeke, the flax has been dried in a certain way to make holes happen. And obviously if you're digging potatoes in your garden and you put them in that kete, what's going to happen? The dirt is going to fall out of the bottom. So this is another Māori world view example of technology in developing that. Uh, obviously for a kete to join together, you have to have the right amount of things happening. So it's almost a type of code. And you can see that you have to have an algorithm. You have to go, runga raro, runga raro, or it doesn't work. It <laughs> falls to pieces. So that's a kete riwai. Uh, number two atoru, uh, he kete whakairo tene. So this is a little bit more of a um, intricate uh, weave of a kete here. And for those of us that are into algorithms and whatnot and the repetition, can you see that there? If you look at the, there's two types of weaves going on in that kete. One of them is niho tanifa uh, and a takitoru weave. So if you can see on the, the lighter colours there, there's a, a tahi, a rua and a toru. Can you see that? So there's a pattern, there's an algorithm happening. Okay, um, right, here we go, next one. Get in the picture? Kawhai. Okay, uh, te reo Māori. <laughs> I'm just going to get into a little talk about kone here because often in our language, one little word is actually opens up the whole story uh, that gives a little command to a whole culture. I've picked just one word here. Uh, this word is the word for beauty or beautiful. And, and uh, our Māori word for that, anyone in the audience, anyone out there in live stream land, what's our word? Atahua kapai. So this is an ata. An ata is a mirror. Yep. An ata is a mirror. And ahua is a shape or a form. So our word atahua actually means when you look into a mirror and you see your reflection, what comes back at you is atahua. Beautiful, right? <laughs> so it opens the key to the door. If code is meant to get us somewhere or to do something, this is one way in Te Ao Māori that this happens. While I'm here on Te Reo Māori e hoa te mako, um, we've recently did some work for Hour of Code, translating Minecraft code into Te Reo Māori. Now that's a little bit tricky because sometimes we don't quite have some of those words yet. Um, someone in the audience, can you give me a Minecraft kind of coding term? Huh? Dig. Yep, dig. So, yep, kitty, build. Um, let's get, what are some of those minerals in Minecraft science people? Can you help me out? <laughs> Programmers. What would it look like? So, the ore. The ore. What is the Māori word for ore? Does anyone know? Okay, neither did I. We had to create one. Okay, to be able, the language had to adapt. So the technology, the hangaro of our language had to adopt. If we're write, write, writing iterative programs, um, we need the word. What is iterative in Te Reo Māori? What is even a program? Because traditionally we didn't have that in our language source. 
Okay, so we're adapting continually, every day. Our language is a living language. And I'm nearly there. Okay, uh, this one is really extra special, next deep technology uh, in my in my whakaaro, my thinking. Uh, ko ngā motea te atato waiata omua, our old songs, our laments, our war songs, our, 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 um, our cries when people died and battles and the stories that we've told are all in our motea tea. And often there is one line that is a code. I'll give you one example is from a, a motea tea written by a queer. And she had written, named out all of these rangatira in her pātere. And um, it was actually a bit of an utu, um, because it was saying that she was a woman of um, great rank. And these were the people that she, yeah, okay. You can learn about that for homework. Last one, the waka. So a waka, how did a waka get here? A waka? Navigation, Wow. No better te- ex- example of a Māori worldview of technology than that. So kia ora. Mm. Halfway. Halfway. <laughs> hey, uh, kai te kite tāo i tēnei au hangarau matihiko. Me nga pū rere, rere ke, uh, e mawhaka mahi ana e nga tamariki i te kāinga i te, I te kura rā nei. Uh, ki āko i heana mea pai, heana pai nga heana mea kāri i te tino pai, mō tēnei au huatanga. So we see today the use of devices by our tamariki and at home as well as at school and with their parents and that and just w- w- what do you see, what do you see as some of the advantages and perhaps some of the disadvantages of this huge advantages uh te pai so huge disadvantages as well i'm a mum Four children. Uh, one of my children has adhd and obviously i'm um, having on a device all the time energy going, neutrons going everywhere. Um, so for us, I go back to a Māori worldview as well about everything is done in unison. There's a whakatauki, uh, a little proverb called e raka te maui, te matau, e raka te maui. So two have to go together. So for me, if he's having a device over here of our children, any child, the two can work together if there's balance. Um, so we see balance all the time in our kapahaka, over here and over here. Everything kind of mirrors. Tapu, noa. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, tāne, wahine. Uh, we're balanced. We, we think uh, about balance often. So for me, balance is important. You're going to play. Yes, son, you can play on Fortnite for an hour. Then you're going to go outside and play. And no more Fortnite. So it's about balance. I don't want to deny him, but I want to empower him to use it as an amazing tool that it is. And te ahuene kua kapi te wahanga ki au, kua rongo i te pere, uh, mena he pātai, o ka tukunatu ki taku, beautiful host, my beautiful, uh, you know, the beautiful te mako. Thank you, kia ora tātou. Thank you. Questions? So the, if there's any questions for um, Anahira, uh, yeah, we've got a bit of time here to, to ask some questions. So we're doing, when we're doing a lot of culturally responsive work, we always try and promote looking back first. What's been done? Uh, in, in, in a Māori thought, you know, mātai whakamuri, so you can move forward. So looking back to see what is there. So if I've, uh, as I've done today, I've picked some examples that are cultural around technology and just saying, okay, what happened here? What's the stories? I don't know if that's much for help, but yeah. Just thought of kānga pido, rotten corn too. I just had to, yeah. <laughs> kia ora. N- another question? I hate kia ora. Yeah, um, uh, maybe the um, as a first step, um, obviously our whānau and our communities are having that human relationship, but if I can refer, to, I've got to do the props for the new digital readiness programme um, because it is based on a Māori worldview. Kia takatu a matihiko is based on the story of Māui and Mahuika. 
Um, so maybe if you haven't checked out Digital Readiness, please check it out. There's so much rich narrative around culture and tech in that space. Okay. Or ring us, 0800 Anaheda. <laughs> well, not really, that could be a bit bad. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> he pātai ana. Now, Mihi Nui, a pleasure and a privilege to have both bicultural perspectives and bilingual. Now, Mihi Nui to you both. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome Charlotte French to the stage. Now, I was in Invercargill watching TV when Charlotte was on TV. I snapped a photo of the screen, tracked her down, and welcome her here today. A a pre sorry, pleasure and a privilege to welcome Charlotte French. Time. Oh, good morning, everyone. So, um, who's got the clicker? Well, it's just over here. So, I'll just go to my slides. Here we go. So, um, yes, I am an engineer. I graduated in 2016 from University of Canterbury with a degree in civil engineering, and I've been practicing as a transport engineer for the last two years. And as a part of my job, um, I'm quite passionate about getting out into the school communities and advocating for engineering and telling the students what we actually do because there are some misconceptions of who we are and what it takes to be an engineer. So I'd like to tell you a bit about some of my experience with that. So the number one question we get is just what is an engineer? And unfortunately a lot of the students, especially the younger ones, think that we look like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> now this isn't always the case. Maybe internally we, we may feel a bit like nerds every now and then, but we're just everyday people. And another misconception that comes across sometimes is that engineering is, is just one subject, but there's actually so many different types of engineering out there. Um, so there's the big five, which you may have heard of. We've got civil, mechanical, mechatronics, electrical, and chemical. But there are actually like hundreds more out there, and it's only limited by what we need in society. So there's industrial engineering, there's petroleum engineering, there's environmental engineering for the complete opposite side of that. And I guess something that I really am passionate about is educating children and students that there are these options out there and that you don't have to be um, a brilliant genius to get there. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about is why I'd be, like to be an engineer, just to give you some idea of what it takes. So now, first of all is problem solving. Now problem solving is key in being an engineer. It's being able to take what you have in front of you and turning something amazing out of it. So designing the best solutions for all situations and all users. <coughs> Working as a team, being collaborative and communicating your ideas is also key in this situation. And finally, being creative and innovative. Now this is something as adults that we don't always get that opportunity to do. We are constrained by society's expectations and constrained by society's rules. However, I find students are just so creative, I'm sure you can all attest to. Now, um, I was fortunate enough to go to a school uh, last year in um, a little country school in Prebleton down in Christchurch and do a talk about what I do as a transport engineer, so designing roads and designing cycleways, and focused a lot on active travel. Now, active travel is designing for vulnerable road users, so that is cyclists, there's pedestrians, there's wheelchair users, even animals. And I ran a little activity with them that I would like to run with you guys today, a very, very condensed version, of course. Now, um, for those of you in the room, there were some pieces of paper that I put out on the desk earlier. This is the time that you're going to need those. Hopefully, there's enough for everyone. For those of you on the webinar, there will be um, an image come up hopefully next, there we go. So this is what um, people here in the room are looking at. Feel free to sketch this up if you're watching over the internet. Um, and I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to just come up using your own existing knowledge, I'm not gonna give you the full workshop, <laughs> and come up with a way to make this a safe place for cyclists, pedestrians, wheelchairs, in 30 seconds, so starting right now.
Doesn't have to look tidy or, or fancy, just whatever you get out there. All right, five more seconds. Okay, pencils down. <laughs> um, so now I have from some people in the room, um, what are some generic things that they came up with? Who, who kind of did put cycle lanes on their road? Yep, so that's the majority. Um, did anyone do a pedestrian crossing of some sort? Yep, there we go. Um, did anyone do a bit more creativity, like maybe a, a bridge? Oh, an overbridge, nice, I like it. And an underbridge, awesome. Yes, now, now we are understanding that overbridges and um, underbridges, they're quite expensive endeavours. So we are very used to seeing out there in the world, those cycleways on the road, maybe even off the road, um, and those pedestrian facilities. But when I went and spoke to these kids, now I showed them photos of these existing facilities. I showed them these cycleways that are going in Christchurch in Auckland, um, dare I ask. And um, we, some of the things that I got back were just fascinated me. And this is an example here. I don't know how well you can see that. This is what a kid came up with. Now, to explain what this is, they've done an overbridge. However, they've done a three-way overbridge right into the centre with a roundabout in the middle and separating lanes to keep all the users separate. Now, this astounded me because this is what this isn't what I taught them. I, ne I never gave them this idea. That this this six year old, how old is it? Year five, ten year old child came up with this entirely on their own, and it is that innovation. It's that awe and passion for making something useful for everyone that really um, drives me to come speak to these children and connect them with, with my industry because it is children like this that will make this place, uh, this world a better place in the future. Another example here, hopefully you can see that, is um, the bridges again. However, they really focused on the wheelchairs and uh, they, they knew that people in wheelchair use couldn't exactly get up over a bridge, especially if it was an arch bridge. So they decided to put elevators at the other side of the bridge. Now, in the real world, we probably couldn't afford that in a situation, but it's about that creativity. It's about getting those brains working and thinking in those problem-solving ways that um, I think is something that, as ed is educators, we really need to keep, um, keep going right from the beginning of primary school all the way through to high school. So, one of the questions that I get asked, especially by high school students when I do career talks, is what, what do I need to be an engineer? Now, the misconception, there are a few misconceptions about this, but the first thing is, is that you don't need to be an Einstein at maths. It's definitely useful. I'm not saying that if you're an Einstein at maths, you can't do engineering, but it is not a requirement. I was good at maths, but I wasn't brilliant. And the ability to draw is another one. You, you don't have to be Picasso to <laughs> be able to become an engineer, especially in this day and age with technology. Everything is out there for you. Now, an understanding of complex science is once again useful, but it's more the understanding of your environment around you and how you can use it. That is what is more valuable. And perfect grades, once again, I'm not going to say what we say in engineering. Actually, I will. We call it C's get degrees, but don't think like that. <laughs> <laughs> so in the engineering world, we, we aren't perfectionists because we live in a world that is imperfect. And so if we try to make everything perfect, then we're not going to get anywhere, really. And of course, no social life. Now we have a social life. <laughs> we, we may have to work hard and be dedicated, but we, we do get out and have some fun. So that is the, the key things that I tell, my, tell the students that I talk to, because they are, when they hear of these things from engineers who have to spend all their time, they, they get turned off. They're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that. But it's not necessary. So that's something that I really, really stress. So what is necessary to be an engineer? As I said before, dedication. You have to get through a degree. You have to, you will hit a wall, both figuratively and literally sometimes, and you need to be able to push through that and think of different ways to get around it. You need to be curious. So I'm sure some of you have um, students in your class that ask lots and lots of questions. Now, they can be frustrating, but they are the people who have those active minds. They're the ones that we want to foster and become into this industry because they are the ones who question society and say, right, let's not just do the things that we have done constantly the same. How can we make this better? Innovative, as we've said many times before, and as you've seen with those examples, creativity is um, a complete necessity in engineering. And then communication. So it's not very useful to have all these creative thoughts and then not be able to tell people about them. So um, being an engineer is also about expressing those ideas in a way that everyone, not just other engineers, can understand. And then finally, problem solving, once again, because it's such an important part of engineering. Oh, and passion, 
of course, passion. Passion is um, the last point there, is that without passion, we're not going to be able to turn these children from um, inquisitive minds into practicing engineers because they need that passion and that drive to get through. So how can you help is the final part. As educators, it is you are that point of call. You are that connected to us as an industry. So I went through the school system all the way through to get to where I am today. So I couldn't have got to where I am without people like you. And so the first thing is that I implore you to educate everyone. I'm not talking about just educating the students on what engineering is and where, what they need, but also educate the parents. Because one of the saddest things is that someone did a survey, I can't remember exactly where, but women in engineering is, is a very difficult um, thing to get happening sometimes and one of the reasons why many women don't go into engineering is because they don't, their parents think that it's not a good job for them because there's too many men. So educate the parents on, on also about what engineering is. Highlight the many faces of engineering. There are so many different types of engineering out there and use activities, use um, like an activity I just ran today to show transport engineering um, or uh, the Fermented foods is another one that um, Danielle was talking about. That's a, a type of food engineering could be equivalent with that. And last but not least, use real engineers. Use us. Now, we are interested in coming to schools and taking kids out to site and really getting them involved in what engineering is so they can see what we do and that we don't just sit around behind a desk all day. We actually get out there. So that is something I really... Um, would love for you guys to take from this is that we are out there and we have expos, we have a national body that we like to use, so please use us. So I'm just going to leave you with this quote here. This is what I really think sums up engineering is that it's not about using the box and thinking out, it's not, no, it's not about thinking outside the box, sorry, because that's what we have artists for, we have creatives. It's about looking at the box and thinking what can we actually do with it to make this world a better place. So thank you. What a pleasure and a privilege to hear from you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Charlotte. Right. Now, we've just had a request from the chat that when there are questions, we'll bring the mic to you. So questions for Charlotte, please. Who's going to start us rolling? Any questions? Any questions from, this, from the live stream chat, Tessa? Uh, just going to look now. And questions in the room? Danielle. <laughs> I asked, when are you in Auckland again? <laughs> um, well, I come up sporadically, so I'm from Christchurch, and um, I, I fly up maybe once a month, generally, So, but I'm sure I can make anything work. So, My, my company's in, very much in support of what I'm doing here, so... Just get in contact, get in touch. I have a question online from yes. Jackie Young. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jackie. Who do we contact to arrange a visit or visitor? Good question. Um, so the, to contact someone um, to get in touch about organising a visitor or site visit, we have Engineering New Zealand um, are currently going through a bit of a restructure, but they used to have a programme called Future in Tech. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, so they work in the STEM or the STEAM environment, and they act as that third-party facilitator. Because they're going through a bit of a restructure, I think this is a little bit on hold, but to be honest, I'm sure if you just contacted a company directly, so there are consultancies out there, they're probably the best to get in touch with. So um, some names I'll just throw out there is GHD, it's a company I work for, um, Stantec, Becca, um, Opus or WSP Opus. So there's a, lots out there, a quick Google, and just getting in touch with the office itself, they'll pass you on to the right person, that would be my advice there. But once Engineering New Zealand um, uh, figures out how they're going to put Future and Tech forward further, um, that will be your first point of call. They're very, very, um, very useful and they provide trained facilitators for those purposes. So, hope that answered that question. Okay, yeah. My question is, um, as a, a teacher of Year 5, 6 students, I'm really <laughs> interested in, in the fact that you um, use the talent of these wonderful creative children that I teach. Yes. Do you use it? Do you take their ideas? What, what, what do you do with these wonderful concepts that they come up with? Um, so 
as much as I would love to have used the, the bridge concept, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, um, within reason. We, we, in the real world, as I'm sure you're all aware, we do have a slight limiting factor called money. Um, and so these fantastical ideas are um, really lo like fantastic to think about for these larger projects. Although, just thinking back now, um, that I wonder if I can go back on the slides to that image of what the second image was. Oh, missed it. There we go. So you can see that the bike lanes on road, uh, multi-ways. So I actually told the students about something like that, but what I didn't tell them, uh, I didn't go into too much detail about traffic signals. And something that this child's come up with here was prioritizing cyclists so that when a cyclist comes, all traffic signals stop. Now that is actually something we're piloting in Christchurch at the moment. Mm -hmm. So even though we may not directly use those ideas, they are coming up with them and you never know. There may be this um, year five, year six child that comes up with a fantastic idea that, that should definitely get put forward. So I'm not saying that's not a possibility, but um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely something to consider, I think. Pure Charlotte, thank you so No, thank much. you, thank you very much. It's now my absolute ple uh, pleasure and privilege to take us across to the Gold Coast mm -hmm. and we're connecting with Kathy. Hopefully we've got Kathy all ready to go. So we're beaming Kathy in to beam out. And if I can just borrow the clicker from you, please, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready to go. Can you hear me? We certainly can hear you. Can I just get away from everybody there so that I know they're not stunt people or something like that? Okay, good. Good, they're alive. <laughs> All right. How are you feeling, guys? Tell me when to kick off. I want to get her. This is so fun. I don't know if you guys can see, but this is what I'm seeing at the moment as they stare into my screen. <laughs> are we ready to rumble? Just give us a minute. We're just working with the wee technicality here. Just give us one moment and we'll be right with you. Is this Kathy? Oh, sorry, Kathy. Is this Kathy? Hey, Kathy, from Australia. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a Twitter handle, Kathy, and all the amazing things you're doing in the art world? It's Becky speaking. We've had a great time at UN so far, and while we, I'm filling up the space while we do the techo. So I want to like to share your Twitter handle with these lovely people because you're a great tweeter and you're a great sharer of um, all things gold in the spaces that you work in. So um, thank you so much. It's, um, it's really important to me to share. Sharing is caring, as the saying goes, and so um, amplifying students' voice is one thing, and I think the conversations around that are really powerful. Um, but I'd really like to see it progress more to teachers and what we can share about our context with others so that we can make real the things that are happening for our students real for others. Because at the end of the day, just being there with you um, at ULEARN, um, you know, we are the privileged ones who are having this experience today. So anything we can do to share these ideas out would be great. And um, I'd love to switch you over to my PowerPoint now because this is the 4.30 in the morning phase that's happening here. Is that okay? <laughs> Can I flick you over? And then, then I'll kick off. Now, the volume's not super loud for me, so as I just put this up on the screen, before I start my run, just tell me that everything looks good. So, have you got my, you got my presentation yet? So, can you see my slides and not me now? Perfect. So, 10 minutes from now, right? That didn't count. It's 10 minutes from now. Um, I've got a lot to talk to you about because um, in my role at St Hilda's on the Gold Coast, I teach a lot of stuff. I have more classes than just about anybody I've ever met with four year sevens and four year eights and a year nine and a year 10. Uh, um, and I teach them visual arts, design technology and STEAM programs, but actually every day these students teach me more than see it. So I want to show you a lot of stuff and there's conceptual points, but today is also going to be a focus on lesson seeds and just starting points. So certainly bits of conversations that we can continue later and idea sparks that hopefully will really kind of be powerful points for you to 
kind of knit together the things that you're doing in your context already um, with the things that people are doing across Asia and the US because I'm also very fortunate to be around the world um, peeking into lots of different classrooms. So here we go, kicking off. Um, you know, setting the scene with STEM um, is an interesting one because this acronym sometimes leads people to arts-rich learning experiences who wouldn't necessarily be part of that dialogue. So that's really nice. And I'm not gonna talk about kind of arguing for the A in STEM at the moment, but of course, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was a really important thing. So no rubrics or definitions, but let's have a look at the positive premise that arts-rich cross-curricular ideas can be shared and can actually help all of us to teach artfully because it's a really mixed media world that we live in. And so I'm always kind of interested in the way education has been so siloed. Um, for art teachers really, and artists, it's a mixed media world. And, and, and in that way, um, we're very comfortable with using all kinds of different tools and new ideas. And so kicking off with the camera is often the way that we generate starting points. And so connecting students to their world through the device that they're probably very likely to have in their back pocket is important because if they're going to be creative or make something, we know that by the time they're in middle school, this is probably the go-to tool. And so it's never too early for us to start to talk about their ability to communicate and what it might look like if they can use their skills with confidence um, in a variety of mediums. So here you're seeing students using their live camera new compositions and they're zooming and cropping with visual feedback about their decisions coming to them instantly on the screen. And this kind of technology integration is not about getting rid of anything. There's no sort of out with the old and in with the new. We still have the chalk and cardboard and oil painting. But in this image, you're seeing the premise that devices can extend us out of studio practices and push works into something new, a space maybe that sort of wasn't accessible before. And that's what we love to see technology used. When we can't do something in any other way, I think we know that we're probably onto a spot that's going to be interesting. Sometimes it's actually about slowing down and learning to look and to really see. And I think that's important in a world where there's so much dialogue about how students are really moving past things and not seeing things because they're staring into their devices. Um, with slow motion photography like this in the art room, um, looking at the emerging form in this rising smoke, we can take it into a scientific investigation of the reaction taking place. And we'll see students automatically get their devices out to use the same tool to record a titration and to make um, ideas visible. Um, the wonder piece here is really important too. Let's have a look how this lens changes the way the students are seeing materials in front of them. Look at this! Oh, there's a car! Can you just like get excited in any classroom about that kind of noise? It's the same noise I notice in any subject area where students are excited about something. And this is just the start of a new process, but the play is important here. Artists are really into this concept of play and have been for a long time. It is another word for experimenting for us. And so that wow factor becomes a hook. And again, with technology integration, um, we really have this fantastic place for the students to get excited about what their devices can allow them to create. And I think that's, that's a pretty powerful kind of way of seeing it in that little clip. Um, we can sort of use the old and the new together because our students are surrounded by inspiration. And I know this is a common thread in all of our STEAM areas. Our world is an exciting place full of possibilities. So our cameras are often busy collecting those starting points. Um, in this mural, we've actually used the kaleidoscope app you just saw being used by that little one. And we've repeated and reworked and extended the shots out on our iPads and so taking those into the 3D printer, we've actually created these great rubbing plates. Um, but we're also at the moment looking at producing some tiles for these with a project that's going to be about building. Um, so that construction could get a little bit crazy. I'm just warning you, you're gonna see some things on that in, in um, the future on Twitter. Um, but these amazing mandalas are being created here by grade one students as they look through the lens, the challenge here is color theory. And we've done all kinds of things with the refraction of light 
um, how, how colour is actually created, and even how to use glass and mirrors to recreate some of these fractals and patterns. Um, it gets a little nuts sometimes um, with these connected tasks. We love to use this workflow idea of producing one thing and then another because when you are truly engaged in the creative process, you'll know that a task is only finished when you say it is, when, when it becomes an end um, point that's sort of natural. And so here students could use the same sort of ideas to produce these symmetries and explore radial symmetry. Um, these guys were looking at coral and creating some beautiful coral reefs here. Look at those. In, that's reception class, that one. So really little guys. And these guys here are creating reefs as well. But here we're talking about year eight students and they're mixing all kinds of measuring techniques and producing origami. So the measurements around these beautiful geometric shapes are really quite complex. Um, this is just, you know, to prove it's possible, I guess, the same app as a starting point for some fractal flower gardens um, where the little ones grew these out of the ground at the same time as older students were actually producing pinwheels from these shapes that they identified and cut out of the paper. And they had to make them spin as fast as they could and win a competition. So the aerodynamics of those shapes were really important to them. They're beautiful objects, but I tell you what, when you get to bring a leaf blower to school to test these bad boys out, that's when you know you've got a pretty exciting job, right? Um, here we've got physical items being used to build out the designs that the students have created. Um, and sometimes we get kind of pretty big on these sort of scaling things because this idea that the screen is very small and can kind of be exploded out of is powerful for our kids who sometimes don't necessarily make the connections between the digital world and other. And so that's where it's kind of getting your hands dirty, I think is so, so important. Um, as we think about what our devices can do for us in these creative spaces. Um, so, you know, so many of these works are, are very intentional from the same sort of starting points. These are two-handed drawings um, coming to life here. Um, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm loving this kind of um, idea of the mixed media landscape. So here students are using a, a, an app called Assembly and they're developing a design. One of the finished ones is there on the left. Um, and as part of a STEM challenge, they've, a STEM challenge, sorry, they've actually put that design on a box that they've created in MDF. They've had to work out how to join that box um, themselves and develop some techniques to make that structure really strong. It was all about utilising the material effectively. So a sustainability perspective was there about not wasting things. Um, and of course, what a beautiful um, object to end up with at the end. Um, there's nothing better than watching... <laughs> And there's something even special about that noise, which is why I kept it on there. Like going into a workshop for these guys is incredible. And I think, you know, if I can sort of pass on anything really useful to you today from a theoretical point of view, it would be these next four slides. The idea that we know through a plethora of research, and I guess my 17 years of, of teaching, um, the arts play an important role in the education of students through the development of creative and critical thinking. We know that engagement in really arts rich learning environments does increase students engagement with learning and that it can also improve the culture of the school. So these are the three points, critical and creative thinking, increasing students engagement with learning and improving the culture of the educational environment. So when we talk about STEAM, you know, and we also quite often kind of dovetail that in with conversations about 21st century skills and their usefulness for students going forward, I think we could also have a conversation around artists and the skills that they demonstrate in their working environments. Artists demonstrate comfort with ambiguity. You know, they're quite comfortable to not know exactly um, where they're going or all of the information around a problem. They just know that they have to go through a process to get where they need to be. They have strategies to generate ideas. Artists have strategies to generate ideas. I think this is really important because so often with our students, we ask them to come up with something without that framework of thinking around it. And in doing so, we kind of leave it um, to some students to do the heavy lifting who have these strategies innately. And yet we can all practice them, just like flexing our muscles. If we practice our strategies to generate ideas, they will be there when we need them. And it's race day. Um, artists also, of course, demonstrate curiosity. And isn't this an important one for us to harness with our students in all subjects? And they also have that willingness to, explain, uh, to play and experiment, as I've mentioned. 
So again, mixed media world, right? And not about getting rid of the old and, and putting all of the new in, but rather connecting things. So I'm gonna hit you with a few last slides here with some ideas and, and perhaps lesson seeds or starters. Um, this is the Foldify app that we love to use to think about nets and how two dimensionality works with three dimensionality. We've made stop motion characters, whole cityscapes, entire, entire grocery stores, um, but molecules and, and dice all the while um, using our collaboration, creativity, and our um, kind of honing of our skills around visualizing three dimensional form. We bring still pieces to life. This student's um, delightful painting <laughs> has um, jumped into action here through the use of Funny Movie Maker or um, Chatterpix. You know, I, I had no idea when I started teaching that, that these sorts of things would be happening in my classroom. I had no idea that, you know, these sorts of um, kind of entry points into Google Earth could lead to, to wonderful, whimsical watercolours um, as we really sort of had a look at Carl Sagan's The Pale Blue Dot and explored contour drawings and mapping and surfaces and the structure of um, the micro and macro world. Um, we get super excited about collecting things from our everyday. These students are looking predominantly at sustainability through the lens of STEAM here with the work of artists, um, guiding their kind of investigations of repurposing um, recycled materials. And they're actually advocating for change through the use of visual language, which is a pretty powerful thing. Um, but, you know, speaking of visual language, these guys are using augmented reality to build informative imagery. The virtual birds are flapping around the classroom and we're talking from an arts learning perspective about close up and detail and focus and lighting. And these burgeoning scientists are identifying and sorting out animal characteristics. Um, AR is an interesting one for us because we can see things move from two dimensions to three dimensions and these transformations are exciting. Um, we're starting to use a lot more holograms um, to, to think about the same sorts of um, interesting movements from 2D to 3D. Um, and it's the power of the undo button, I think, for us that, that's pretty important. Look at these guys labelling parts of the face. <laughs> and grappling with a 600 year old process like printmaking by creating etching plates um, on a laser cutter and then sending them through um, the press in the, very much the same way as Gutenberg would have. It's pretty amazing stuff when you see water being refract refracted with light and those images are obviously straight through an iPad or iPhone camera um, or our amazing little art bots cruising around and those projections going up on a big scale on walls or on the sides of buildings. Um, creative coding with light painting is something our class actually started doing about five years ago when Spurious first came out. And so I wanted to, to kind of leave you with this image, um, knowing that this particular picture here through the students um, sharing on Twitter and through the books and, and website that we've created has been shared in excess of 250,000 times. Um, and the lesson plans associated with this have been out now um, through the hands of about the same number of educators. And so um, I think getting started in, in any place that, that you can make a mark is really important um, because the, the kind of ideas that we're looking at here are quite new. And it's really um, considering STEAM as an opportunity to blur the lines between subject areas that I think is important. So um, in opening up to questions, I guess I'd just like to frame them all with the idea that there's been a lot um, that you've seen in this presentation. Um, and so, of course, these are just those starting points I mentioned. And if you need any help with anything from here on in, you can always just hook up with me and um, I'd love to help you to dive further into all of these sorts of ideas. So thanks so much, guys. You've gone really quiet. Does that mean I talked extremely fast? Even for me, that was fast. <laughs> Kathy, wow. Questions there. Wow. Questions for Kathy. I think just wow, Kathy, you've just wowed us. You've stunned us. Here we go. Here's a question, Kathy. Just wondering whether the apps that you use on the iPads are also available on Android for those people that don't use. Apple? Yeah, so, so the, the platform really doesn't matter. I think the ideas are what's really important here. 
Um, in some schools that I work with, they have um, one-to-one iPad environments. Other times it's a trolley. Sometimes it's children's mobile phones. Um, and I think that what is the really important kind of deal here are those two messages on, um, you know, that hybridity of approach, bridging um, the digital and everything else, and also accessing um, whatever kinds of technology you have available. So, um, yeah, most of those things are available on all of the platforms that um, that the students can access. Bill Roberts. Okay, Bill Roberts is asking, how does Kathy incorporate playfulness? And Bill Roberts is online with us at the moment, Kathy. I, I, think, I think playfulness has got to be first. I, I'm always very willing with the students to um, say to them that I'm not sure exactly where things are going to end up. What I'm always sure about as the teacher are the learning objectives, but the way that those are actually reached and perhaps accessed could look really different with all students. So um, I think building lesson design in that includes um, kind of that mentality that I'm going to have all different artifacts from the students. If all of their work looks the same, I've probably gone wrong. Um, and, you know, having a sense of humour about where it goes from here. Um, the interesting thing is I had no formal technology teaching at all. And yet I would say that the technology piece is a very important part of my professional practice. Um, students are often the ones who guide me in what is interesting and what's hot right now. Um, and I love to, to listen to those things. Um, but certainly I also would like to say that I think we try and jam um, the arts learning into STEAM quite often in a way where we might take photos of artifacts or produce a poster for tasks that are actually predominantly other parts of the, the, the STEAM acronym. And so if we, you know, kind of um, move past having to do all things at all times, um, some of the fun factor can come back in for particularly the specialist teachers um, who want to get involved with these sorts of programs. Kia ora, Kathy. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to have you beaming in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We now, we now have the pleasure of moving to M, the maths word that's had a bit of baggage today. So welcome to the stage, Raphael Nolden. Pleasure to have you here. Um, and I will start by saying that this is not the only session I'm running. So I'm doing a quick 10 minute taster today, but tomorrow I've got an hour long spotlight at 8 o'clock in the morning for all those who are awake. So come along and I'll go into much more depth around what we're talking about here. I know we've heard about math teaching this morning for those of you who are here, and I'm clearly not a mathematician. I mean, I could be, I could pull my pants up a bit and everything, but I'm not actually a mathematician. But I'm going to talk to you about math because I'm passionate about it. I think it's one of the keys to unlocking a lot of what we do. But I'll start by saying, I want you all to imagine a world where every child has a private tutor, someone who is always there to help them learn. In this world, even math becomes easy. Just think about that for a moment. You're all teachers. You all know how incredibly effective you are at your job. But you also know that the key challenge for you is the time you have with your students. I spent many years teaching. I know when I taught, one of the challenges was I had a class of students, I had me, and I could only spend you know, two minutes per student. Is that really enough to effectively teach? I don't think it is. I really don't. And that's where I disagree very strongly with this morning's presenter, because I think what we need <coughs> is humans working together with artificial intelligence to make learning more effective. Now, I think the keynote missed the point. He thought it was one or the other. I strongly disagree. We know from the real world that AI by itself and humans by themselves are nowhere near as effective as when we work together. And I think that the future of education is the combination. There is no way I don't want to have teachers. I know how awesome you are. I know how important you are. And there's no way that a machine can replace you. Definitely not yet, 
definitely not for the next 10 years. But I do know, like all of you, that there's not enough of you. There's not enough of you to actually work with all of your students. And so what I know you need is 30 assistants in your class to help you to be more effective. And this is what AI is going to do. So I'm going to talk about this from a mathematics point of view, because that's the area I've worked in. I work and I'm developing an artificial intelligence based private tutor for math, which is designed to work in classrooms. And again, I'll talk a lot more about it tomorrow. And I'm also running a session where you can learn how to use it in your classroom. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I'll give you a quick overview. Just think about it though. This is the world 200 years ago on the left. This is the world where schools were invented. We sent letters, we drive around in horses and carriages, and schools were schools. Now we have self-driving cars, video conferencing, so if the world has changed so much in the last 200 years, why is it that a school from then looked like this and a school now looks like that? Can you spot the difference? I mean, yes, they used to use slates and now we have laptops, but is that really keeping up with the world? I don't think it is. The key challenge here hasn't been resolved. We still have one teacher being forced to teach to the average student. What does that mean? It means your good students are bored, the students that struggle keep getting further behind, and what each of these students really needs is a private tutor who gives them exactly what they need to learn. Now, I used to teach. Do I have enough time to make 30 individual assignments? Do I even know exactly what every student needs? No. Neither do you. I know how much paperwork you have. But if we work in a symbiotic relationship with artificial intelligence, the AI can do those mundane tasks for us. Marking, writing reports, making assignments, 30 different ones for every student. What does that mean? That means the teachers can do the human part of teaching, inspiring, helping out those students that have a bad day doing all of those things that you went to become teachers for. So, how does that look? How does it work? And when will it happen? Well, the answer is it'll happen now. And how does it look? I'll show you in a moment. But before I do, I want to give you two key things, maybe three, which are really important for student outcome. Who here has been disheartened when you spent all of your weekend marking students' work only to see students pick it up and throw it straight in the bin? It's horrible, right? But why do students do it? They don't do it despite you, I promise. It really got me. But I thought about it. The problem is the feedback you're giving them is no longer relevant. They've finished that thing. They're working on something else now. What we need to do is give real-time feedback, right? If I'm trying to solve a problem right now and I'm thinking about it, that's when I need help about it. Not a week later, not two weeks later, my mind is somewhere else. In computer science, we do that. You write code, you press go, it tells you it works or it doesn't. You fix it. It's in your mind. But in our teaching profession, we don't have that luxury. We give homework, student does it, gives it back to us, we mark it, we give it back to the student, They've forgotten about it. They can't remember what they did. We need to have that as a conversational, real-time thing. That's one thing that private tutors do effectively. In your classroom, you have, as I said, a few minutes to do it. But every student should have that on an ongoing basis. So real-time feedback is something AI can do for every student in your class at school, or at home, or on the bus, or on the beach, or wherever else students want to learn. The second key thing is, as I said, individualization, right? You all know that none of your students are the same. They don't all need the same material. Johnny was away for two weeks. 
two years ago, Emma was sick. They're missing things. You don't know what they were missing because a different teacher taught them that. They sit in your classroom, you know about where they are, but you don't know exactly what they know and they don't know, right? And what you really need to do is, before every class, go, right, I need to give you an update on this, I need to revise this for you, you missed that class, there's no way you can do it. But again, AI can help. Because Amy, our <coughs> tutor, understands exactly what you know and don't know on a really granular level. Exactly what it is. And so she can fill in those gaps in real time as the student needs them. Which means you take down all those barriers, all those blocks that get in the way. That's really powerful. And finally, dynamic teaching, which relates to this. I worked a lot at university, and I often had students coming to me saying, I can't do this physics. It's, I just don't get it. <coughs> right? And I sit down with them, five minutes later I go, you completely understand the physics. No problems there. You forgot that algebra you should have learned back in year 10 or 11? Oh, that, but that's, that's math, that's not physics. Yeah, but we, they connect, you know? And this conversation happened over and over again. And it's the problem of having that depth of understanding all of the requirements and the hierarchy that you need to understand high-level math. Again, do you have time to figure out what those gaps are? No. That takes a lot of time. Again, the AI does. And one great thing that Amy can do, your student could be working on calculus. If they make the right mistakes, she'll take them right back through algebra, geometry, right back to learning how to add up two numbers, finds that point where the students understand it, and then builds up school by school by school until you're back up there. None of the current systems on the market can do it, but the new AI will make that happen. And it's going online very soon. So, here's a quick snippet of how it looks. As you can see, it's very conversational. Amy gives a question, the student chooses an answer, gets feedback on why they did it wrong, and it's the interactive real-time thing. Okay? And that'll, as I said, the, the assignments we create dynamically change. Amy identifies a gap, she throws something new in there. She'll throw something in there for revision, just to make sure you keep it fresh. There's no more standard photocopied sheet for every student. It's now, a, this is my learning outcome. Today, my class learns how to factorize quadratics. Every student does something completely different to get to that outcome. And I don't think any government should put that workload on humans, but AI is there to serve us, and AI will make that possible. And then you have time to become an inspiring teacher and make learning math easy for everyone. Thank you. Yet again, wow, and bang on time. Questions from the room, wonderings. Where, I'm not sure if I understand how the app would specifically know where the gaps are. Um, they would need to know that maybe the history of the student, so are you saying that that needs to follow the student right throughout education, or no. is it just what they're working on and they extract what the gaps are from exactly what they're working exactly. on. So, so it extracts what the gap are. So if I take back this example, yeah. and this is the first time a student's used our system, as soon as you make this mistake, Amy understands what that comes from. Now, to explain how that works is a little bit more than I can do in an hour. I have a team of incredibly clever people who have spent the last two years working on that system to make it work. From what we can tell, it is unique in the world. I was actually in Singapore a couple of days ago talking to a math professor there, and he said this is just incredible from a research perspective, let alone the teaching side. So he can't wait to actually start using it for his sort of research side. So the, the technology behind this capability to actually understand not just, yes, it's wrong, but why is, is big. Um, and I can't really <laughs> explain that to you now, but it, it's, it's really important and it, it, is, it is significant in, in how it works. So what we basically do is we understand math like a human does. We have the whole understanding of all the connectedness and then we map the student onto that. And so we can start being effective from the first use. 
Kia ora, Raphael. That was awesome. Look, one question online from Tony Kenz. Mm -hmm. uh, where do I sign up? How much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So you can see the website up there. I don't know why there's a P randomly, but um, amy.app. Ah, oh, so this, this P should be on the end there. It's www.amy.app with a double P. I don't know why it's done that. Um, you can, that's our website, so you can have a look at it there. Uh, right now we've got some content on there for the primary school kind of market. And for now that's free to use. Go a lot of high school stuff with them as a partnership. And we'll probably do an announcement of that in about a month. So just keep your eyes open. We'll, we'll um, announce. If you connect with us on our Facebook or Twitter, don't really use Twitter much, but Facebook, we have got a page there or sign up as on our newsletter on the website and then we'll keep you posted. But it's really important for us actually, the core behind it is to democratize education and make it more accessible. So for me, I wanna try and make it as, as accessible as possible. You're absolutely in awe. Can I please invite all of our presenters to come back up here under the screen? We're gonna get Kathy to join us <coughs> above us. Uh, kia ora to you all in the room. Thank you for staying on when lunch is Ready and tummies are grumbling, but <laughs> what a privilege to have a steaming hot session right here, Kathy. Kathy, so we're surrounding you, and we're get, just going to grab a photo as we all acknowledge everyone in the room. <laughs> Namihi nui, steaming hot <laughs> presenters. <laughs> the scenes. <laughs>